Hey everyone, here we are in the next part of this week's material, and that's about elasticity. So elasticity, this really gets at responsiveness. You know, something that's elastic is stretchy, it responds. So um, here we're talking about the responsiveness of demand and supply. So right, elasticity means responsiveness. Um, the law of demand tells us that at higher prices, right, people buy less, and at lower prices, people buy more. Right? So you've already worked on right, like a demand curve. Right? And so at a high price, the quantity demanded is, is quite small. If you lower the price down to, you know, to a lower price, so we'll call this P sub H for, for high price. Here's a low price over here and read the quantity demanded. The quantity demanded at the low price is now much higher. Here was the original quantity right at the high price. So we know that as um, price falls, quantity demanded uh, changes, right? Quantity demanded goes up. That's what the law of demand tells us. Elasticity gets at this question of how much. How big is the change in quantity demanded? when uh, a price changes. So if price, if you raise the price, right, so um, if you're selling a good or service and you raise the price, you would expect to sell less right? because generally at a higher price, people will buy less. The question is how much less? Right? How much do your sales fall when you raise the price? That's what elasticity can help you answer or more specifically price elasticity of demand. We'll also look at several other measures of elasticity, including price elasticity of supply, and then briefly add a couple other measures as well. So price elasticity of demand. Here is the, I like to call it expression for it. You could say formula. Um, it's right here. I don't like generally to memorize things, but you do have to understand this and be able to recall it. Um, now, this is an online class. You'll have open notes, open resources, so you can always look it up. But you're going to get, you need to be familiar with this. Um, you know, in science, we use delta, the triangle, to mean change. So here, we, when I put that percentage sign in front of it, what this means is the percentage change in quantity demanded all divided by the percentage change in price. So percentage change, right? Uh, that's the delta for change there. Boy, that's a sloppy delta, isn't it? How about that? So, percentage change, right? When you see that written. So, percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price. Now, why do we use percentage change? We use percentage change because then it's not sensitive to the units of measurement. So what does that mean? If we just said um, change in quantity demanded over change in price, um, we could measure the quantity or the price in particular units, and we could make that expression look really big or really small. Right? So in the demand section and the supply section, um, I gave you some you know, well-done videos from uh, Marginal Revolution University. They used a lot of examples with oil. Right, that was more of the recurring example had to do with the demand and supply of oil. Well, um, if I want to know how responsive is the change in the quantity demanded of oil to change in the price, um, you know, normally we measure uh, oil in barrels. Right? Um, so if I wanted to change the price and say, well, how, how big is the change in quantity demanded? If I measure it in barrels, I'll get some answer. Right? But... Um, what if I measure it in uh, boatloads, right? One of those big tanker vessels, right? Um, uh, so an oil tanker. You know, I want to know if the price goes up a certain amount, how many fewer tankers do they sell? Or what if I measure it in gallons? Or what if I measure it in ounces or milliliters? I can get a very, very different answer, right? Um, depending on what units I use. And the same thing down here, right? We usually measure barrels of oil in dollars, but I could measure it in cents, or I could measure it in 
millions of dollars. And that's a pretty weird looking M, isn't it? Let me try again. You can measure it in millions of dollars or billions of dollars, right? Whenever the whenever the price changes from two forty nine nine uh, to you know uh, two forty two nine. Um, you know, normally I would measure that in dollars or cents, but I could measure that in billions, but it would be a very, very small number, right? There'd be a zero and then a whole bunch of other zeros before you get to the part where that actually matters. So can you see how if you fiddle with this, we could make this expression look really big or really small? Well, so well, that means I'm sensitive to the units of measurement. With percentage change, I'm not, right? Percentage change um, looks at uh, the change divided by usually the starting value or we'll ultimately use the midpoint of the two, the average of the two values, the units fall away and you're left with a pure number. That's the advantage of using percentage change. You're no longer sensitive to the units of measurement. Now, I mentioned this midpoint method um, thing. Generally speaking, if, if a price uh, increases from $2 to $3, how would you normally describe that? You would say, if the price goes from $2 to $3, the price has gone up by, well, if you said 50%, that's a pretty good answer, right? And using the traditional method, um, you basically say, if you start at $2 and you add another dollar to that, that's a change in one over the starting value of two, that's an increase of 50%. Um, so basically, you look at the change in the values and divide by the starting value. Or if you want to get a little fancier, you could say n2 minus n1. So if we called this n1 and we called this n2, we look for the change, right? That's the increase. And then divide by the starting value. That would be um, the traditional way of doing it. But the problem with that is that when the price goes from two to three, we call that an increase of 50%. But what happens if it went from $3 to $2? Well, then it falls by a dollar, right? So it goes down and the, the, the starting value then in that case is three. So it falls by one over three, it falls by a third or minus 33%. And that's where, and, and that is the traditional way it's done, right? That's uh, how percentage change is generally calculated. That works pretty well most of the time. Economists don't like it. Because if we're looking at a demand curve, we pick out these two points, A and B, and we want to know how responsive the change in quantity demand is to a change in price, right, between A and B. So here's the price, you know, at point A. Here's the price at point B. Here's the quantity demanded at A, and here's the quantity demanded at B. Right, and so we want to know over this range how sensitive, how responsive is quantity demanded to a change in price. And we don't really, it doesn't really matter to us if the price is moving from A to B or B to A. We want to know how sensitive is it over this range, right, in this, in this section of the demand curve. The problem is if we, if we call A the starting point and B the second value, then we get one answer for the percentage change in price and the percentage change in quantity. But if we started at B and went back to A, we get a different answer. Um, that's not particularly helpful. So, what we use in economics is the midpoint method. Hmm, thought I changed the color here to get funky, but there we go. This is the midpoint method. And so the midpoint method is really as simple as it sounds. It's just um, you look for the change, but instead of dividing by the starting value, and you don't just randomly divide by the ending value, you divide by the average of those two. You divide by the um, midpoint of the starting and the ending value. So again, if we go back to our generic, right, n1 and n2, the, the formula for the midpoint method is the change, 
You know, so so if you had an you know if you have an n1 and an n2 starting value and an ending value, you find the percentage change using the midpoint method by looking at the change in those values, n2 minus n1. That's the change. But then instead of dividing by n1, you're going to divide by the average or the midpoint of those two. Right, the average of n1 and n2, so you basically add them together and divide by 2, and that gives you the average of those two values. So um, this would be the formula right, for finding the percentage change using the midpoint method. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's the midpoint method. And so if you were going from $2 to $3, well, that would be an increase of 1, um, and then over what? Well, over the midpoint or the average of 2 and 3. So if you add those up, divide by 2, you'll find that the average is 2.5. And so you get 1 um, over 2.5, which turns out to be a 40% increase. On the other hand, if it went from 3 to 2, then what's the change? Well, the, the, it's a fall of 1, right? It's minus 1. And then the average is still 2.5. And so if the price went from 3 to 2, using the midpoint method, you would say that's a decline of 40%. So when the price goes from 2 to 3, using the midpoint method, you'd say price goes up by 40%. When the price goes from 3 to 2, you'd say it goes down by 40%. You get the same value either way. The same thing would work for the quantity if we had this, if we had this data, QA and QB, and we were going to calculate those. The one thing I guess I, oh, I did do it here. Um, before we had uh, going from two to three, we said was an increase of 50, but going from three to two was a decline of 33%. That discrepancy was not helpful. Using the midpoint method, we get the same value, right? Either up 40% or down 40%. That is the midpoint method. So um, there you go. Uh, price elasticity of demand. Um, this is the, the expression right, that we use. You now know percentage change in quantity demand and percentage change in price. You know how to calculate those from values. Generally, I'll probably just give you a percentage change in price or percentage change in quantity demanded, but um, if I give you some actual points on a demand curve, you know how to use the midpoint method. Right? You've got your notes. Um, uh, you can go back and review uh, the video. Uh, if I give you the coordinates for those two points, you can calculate right, the, per the, the percent of change in price. It's getting kind of sloppy. I don't like that. And then here's the percentage change in quantity demanded. Uh, you could use the midpoint method and find. So, so that's the change. You could find the percentage change. I'm sorry. If I give you the coordinates for those two points, you know, call them A or B, whatever you want. Um, this says P, that's a price up there. You could find those percentage changes, plop them in here and get uh, an answer. So the last thing for this little segment, what do we do with that answer? Well, um, one note, when you solve for the price elasticity of demand, you will always get a negative answer. And that is because the demand curve slopes down. So if the demand curve is downward sloping, then we know if you're looking at two points on this demand curve. If the price goes up, then the quantity demanded will go down. If, on the other hand, um, the price falls by a certain amount, then the quantity demanded will go up. Right? That's what the law of demand says. There's an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. So they'll always move in opposite directions. And therefore, if your percentage change in quantity demanded is positive and going up, then the change in price, percentage change in price will be negative. It'll be going down and vice versa. So you should always get a negative answer. And I'm going to insist that you pay attention and carry that along, right? If you, um, the, the price elasticity of demand should give you a negative answer. The reason that people get a little sloppy is because in terms of interpreting it, the first thing we do is take the absolute value and we compare that to one. And of course, when you take the absolute value, the negative sign falls away. 
And so when you start comparing it, you're looking at strictly the magnitude, not the sign. Um, nevertheless, we're going to look at other measures of elasticity. And since some of those, the sign is very important. The sign does give us information. And so both because it's technically correct due to the downward sloping demand curve that the price elasticity of demand is negative, then when you answer the question, the price elasticity of demand should be negative. Include the negative sign. Um, and then secondly, being in the habit of being careful right, and, and um, specific about the signs will help you when you get to other measures of elasticity where the outcome in terms of sign is not known and the outcome is very, very telling and conveys important information. So um, what we're going to do, though, is just compare it to 1. If the absolute value is greater than 1, then we will label that and think of that as elastic. And if the absolute value is less than 1, we will call that inelastic. And then there's the, those are the two big categories, um, where the absolute value is greater than 1 or the absolute value is less than 1. Of course, it is technically possible that the absolute value is exactly equal to 1. And in, in that situation, unusual as it may be, we call that unit elastic. And so these are like buckets or categories that we can classify our answer into. So if you calculate the price elasticity of demand, and you get an answer that, uh, that the absolute value of which is greater than 1. So if you get minus 2.6 right, as the price elasticity of demand, you take the absolute value that's greater than 1, you would classify that as elastic. And of course, if you got something, if you calculated the price elasticity of demand, you got something between zero and minus one, right? Such that when you took the absolute value of it, it was less than one, you would classify that as inelastic. And of course, the last option, um, if it's equal to one, that is in fact unit elastic. That means that proportionally, the change in price is equal to the change in quantity demanded. Let's do a quick um, practice problem here, a couple of quick ones. If the price goes up 10% and quantity demanded goes down 18%, what does that mean? Well, price elasticity demand is percentage change in price over percentage, uh, I'm sorry, percentage, percentage change in quantity demanded divided by percentage change in price. So here, if the price goes up by 10%, I put that in the denominator. If quantity demanded goes down by 18%, I put that in the numerator. So I get minus 18 over 10, um, that's minus 1.8. If I took the absolute value of that, I'd get something that's greater than 1, so I would classify that as elastic. All right, second one. If the price goes down 10% and the quantity demanded goes up 7%, um, let's see, price goes down 10%, that goes in the denominator, so I'll put that downstairs. Quantity demanded goes up 7%, that goes in the numerator. That gives me uh, minus 0 0.7. If I take the absolute value of that, that is less than 1. And so I classify this as inelastic. And finally, last one. If the price goes down 5%, right, the price goes down, that's a minus 5. That goes in the denominator. Quantity demand that goes up 10%. That's a plus 10 in the numerator. That gives me a minus 2. Take the absolute value that is greater than 1. So I classify that as elastic. And there you go. That is the strict calculation and then the classification based on it. One other note. We sometimes in economics, too often I would say, but we use the, um, we use the same term sometimes in different contexts or to mean different things. So... Um, Elastic and inelastic, and for that matter, unit elastic, have technical definitions, and we can calculate the price elasticity of demand, and we can sort them into bins based on that. We also sometimes use elastic to mean a, a sort of a qualitative you know, um, level of responsiveness. So something is more elastic if it shows a greater sensitivity to price, and something is less elastic if it shows less sensitivity to price. So even though the first answer up here is elastic and the third problem that we solved here is also elastic, they are both technically elastic because the 
absolute value of the price elasticity of demand is greater than one. Um, but if we were to compare them, um, the minus 1.8 and the minus 2, one of them shows a greater sensitivity to price than the other. So um, the last one you could say is more elastic. That demand curve that's represented in this third example, you could say is more elastic than the one represented in the first. They're both technically elastic, but in a, uh, in a comparative sense, one shows a greater sensitivity. So don't get bogged down by that. I just want to throw it out there so you, don't, um, you aren't thrown off by it either. All right, the last thing to talk about here, how does this calculation or this comparative sense um, translate into the graphs? Um, more elastic means more sensitive to price. And so our graphical kind of shorthand for that is that a demand curve that shows greater sensitivity to price will tend to be flatter. And a demand curve that is less sensitive to price will tend to be steeper. Because, let me change colors again, <clears throat> highlight this, for a given change in price, So here is a particular change in price. Here is a very large change in quantity, suggesting that the, the change in quantity demanded is very responsive, right? very sensitive to a change in price. And over here, I'm trying to draw approximately the same change in price. And here, it leads to a very, very small change in quantity demanded. So this is the first one, the top of the example up here. This is more elastic. This is um, very sensitive to price. There's, a, there's a, a high degree of responsiveness to price. Price goes up a little bit. People cut back on their um, consumption of something a lot. Down here... Um, this is less sensitive, right? This is not that sensitive to price. Right? Because for this roughly the same change in, in price, you got a very, very small change in quantity demanded. And so one of the next things we need to talk about is what drives that. What are the things that cause demand to be more sensitive in some cases and less sensitive in others? And that's where we're headed next. For now, let's take a deep breath and take a break.